What do you think is the biggest misconception about um, being an academic? <laughs> We're all very nerdy introverts and we have no social life. Um, and some of those things are partly true. <laughs> uh, the fact that we do no work all day. There's some stuff that's uh, I think interesting for a, a documentary, there's stuff that's not quite so interesting. So there's going to be a lot of me sitting here uh, typing uh, at the computer. Uh, then from there it goes to the slightly more interesting uh, taking meetings. The benefit of the Soul Fellowship, which is obviously you get the extra money for the resources, but there's also a bit of extra expectation then as well, like you meant to soar. <laughs> So this evening we're going to have a uh, public event on the role of militaries in health emergencies and looking at the experiences of the Ebola outbreak and then thinking about what does this mean for the future. We've ended up getting um, a series of different people from humanitarian organisations as well as other external bodies to come and have a chat uh, and to hear from military personnel that were actually engaged in the Ebola response. There's 300 um, reports of disease outbreaks at least every year, which are significant events. Prior to the Ebola outbreak, the World Health Organization had really walked away from talking about disease outbreaks in terms of health security. And then Ebola happened. And on the other side of Ebola, everyone's talking about global health security again. I was one of the key members in the fight against Ebola, so I thought it was necessary to come and, uh, and contribute I uh, gave some of my experience during the Ebola crisis. You know, because I do um, a lot of policy related um, research and I do a lot of field work and I do go to communities that are poor and impoverished, um, it, m it often strikes me to reflect on the fact of how very privileged we are living here in Australia and the job that I've got as an academic. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, and it kind of, it brings it home in a very personal way. <laughs> What time is it? 2.22 at 2.30 or any minute now I'm going into my promotion interview. So this is going from level D to level E, um, which is professor. Oh, only 30 minutes and I've heard that if it's short it's a good sign, so hopefully it's a short one. <laughs> the aim of my research is to find better dietary treatments for obesity. I was um, someone who did struggle with obesity, that was a very long time ago but I was 30 kilos more than I am now. And um, I knew that the strategies that were available were really second rate. People, health professionals don't tend to use fast weight loss because of the perception that it's unsafe. So uh, people in this Tempo diet trial, they're coming in, they're randomised, they lose weight either fast or slow. Yeah. And then we measure a whole load of um, outcome measurements related to health and safety. Good. Yeah, yeah, I think it was good. Oh, it was less than 30 minutes, so that's a little bit short, so See. maybe that's a good sign. Who knows? The challenge is to get that next fellowship so that you'll have your salary so that you can keep doing the research. But it's also a real thrill because it means that if we're in the game, we're in the top of the game. We're going over to CSIRO. Uh, where they have the remote observing room for the Australia Telescope Compact Array. So you, so you can operate the telescope remotely and do all of your observing from there. We are part of the discovery of um, a new uh, uh, binary neutron star merger by LIGO. So LIGO detected these uh, two neutron stars merging and forming a black hole, which is the first time that they detected gravitational waves from something like that. Right. Our team um, at Sydney Uni were part of the follow-up team. So we were observing with a radio telescope trying to look for electromagnetic radiation from the neutron stars. If you imagine you've got two stars, um, in this case the neutron stars, if you imagine the mass of the sun in a region the size of a city, you have a neutron star. Now two of those neutron stars were orbiting each other and due to gravity they spiral closer and closer um, and they can't escape that attraction 
and eventually they merge. So you're seeing the uh, you're seeing an explosion that happened 130 million years ago, and you're seeing the moment when a new black hole forms. So basically, for the last yeah month and a half, all we have done is work on on this result: the science, the politics, the paper writing. And so when I applied for the Saw Fellowship. Um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is what's the best use of, of, of a sort of extra boost in resources. This was one of my main scientific goals, um, and but it's a very intense time, and what you need in that time is extra people to help process the data, help do things very quickly. You know, the resources from the Soil Fellowship sort of helps to, you know, make it possible to do that intense science. It's good when you get funding for something and then you actually get yes. a result, so don't put that in. The officials are here not only to check your qualifications to vote, but also to protect your right to vote. My research is on Australian politics and democracy, and I look at political parties and try to understand why political parties aren't really operating in the ways that we want them to. Um, and as part of the, the Saw Fellowship, what I'm going to be doing is looking more specifically at how Australian political parties can better engage multicultural Australians. For me, the biggest challenge is getting access and getting people to agree to the research. Um, I've had more knockbacks, I think, from political parties. It's a reason why the research is really difficult and it's a reason why a lot of it hasn't been done because you're researching things or organisations that are really reluctant to be looked at. It's a, a fairly uh, ambitious goal to reinvigorate politics in Australia. But you know, look, I've still got 30 years, I think at least, of a career, so I've got to have something to do. You know, whenever you have a win in research, you also have an epic fail. And my epic fail, uh, which hopefully I can recover from, I worked really, really hard at the beginning of the year on securing access to um, Nick Xenophon and his political party. I spoke to him about my research and he seemed really, really interested in all of that and I asked him if I could get access to do some work with the party surveying the, the supporters of the Nick Xenophon team and he's like, yeah, absolutely. I encourage academic research and transparency. And then two weeks later, he was found to be um, possibly a, a dual citizen facing the High Court challenge and, and now he's resigned from federal parliament. So like with, in the space of two or three weeks, seven months worth of work trying to establish a research relationship with this, with this uh, senator and his party goes out the window. So that was a bit of a low. Chemistry happens at very high temperatures and it tends to be doesn't necessarily need to be in the sort of shiniest, cleanest environment. So we're often, we're usually consigned to the basement. This is a nice shiny new door. It, up until very recently, it still said women's toilets. The research I'm focusing on in this project is about materials for energy storage and conversion. So specifically, ionic conducting materials for battery and fuel cell applications. I'm working very much on the actual atomic scale structure and dynamics of materials. Miniaturising everything down that small and getting it to work and getting it all in place is, is a multi-year project. So this is kind of what my versions of beakers and test tubes are, if you like. And actually this one especially, I know from uh, my student Jatu who just left, he is running a reaction for eight days. So he's taking solids, melting them, um, and then cooling very, very slowly so that it solidifies very slowly in order to try to grow crystals. Probably about once a year or so you get some result where you think, wow, wow, that is, that's good. No one's, no one's had that before. I've been living in Perth now and working full-time in Sydney uh, for almost two years. And people often say to me, oh gosh, that must be hard on the family. Oh, you know, how long is that going to last for? but it's actually the best thing for, for family. I get to grow up with their cousins and my mum and, and my sisters and brothers. It's just better, better for the kids. Yeah, it really helps me to balance things. Day to day, what you do as a scientist um, and as an astronomer is a lot of problem solving with data. But one of the things I love about talking to the public is that the, in those 
periods. That's when I get the time and reflect on the big picture, how amazing the universe is and, you know, the wonder of the universe. So having kids taught me to step back and let other people just step in and to help those other people and enable them and that has been amazing. Because it does take so much out of you, we do it because we love it and we can see the potential benefit of doing it and changing the world as a result of it.